Welcome to Faith at Work, the preaching and teaching ministry of W. Carey Hedgepath. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And now, Faith at Work. Today I'm going to speak to you on the subject of of discipleship or being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I suspect I'm going to say some things that maybe you've never heard before. And the reason I'm going to say them is first is because it's true and second is because it may shock you into thinking about what I'm saying and what the scripture is saying. So um, I want you to listen very carefully and I want you to know that what I'm saying is being said in love and with kindness and with gentleness, but I'm telling the truth. You know, Paul said that that, uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction and for instructions uh, and for the truth, and that we're to study, to show ourselves approved uh, so we won't be ashamed as we rightly divide the word of truth. So I'm standing before you today. I'm not ashamed. I I believe with all my heart. I know what I'm talking about. And I'm just trusting. uh, I'm trusting the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to do a great work in someone's life today, just as he has done in mine. And many others, many of you are watching me. Some of you will really appreciate what I'm saying. Some of you may be very concerned about what I'm saying. But I want you to listen carefully. The title of the message is Disciple. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 14. These are the words of Jesus. Now, great crowds accompanied him. They didn't say they followed him. You know, we use that word. They are following Jesus. Are you a follower of Christ? doesn't say these people were followers of Christ. They were just, well, they were following after him. And why? Because they were were interested in watching and seeing what he was going to do next. They were following after signs and wonders. But they did not personally know and love and follow Jesus because of who he was. So it says, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned to them and said, Jesus sees all those people, and he turns to them. He knows that they're wanting, they're they're expecting something great to come out of his mouth, or something for him to do that's great. And this is what he says. Just think about this. He turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, And does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I suspect that shocked the life out of some of those people. What? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What? For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether it has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. Let me tell you something about that. Jesus Christ built a foundation. And he was able to see it all the way through, and it cost him his life. If Jesus Christ had built a foundation and gone out and taught and preached and healed and performed all kinds of miracles, but did not die for our sins, people would mock him. And there's people today that mock Jesus because they don't believe he died for their sins. So he says... Otherwise, he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish it. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? 
And if not, while the others is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, anyone of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. In order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must renounce all things, surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, taking up your cross every day and following him. Now that's a that that is that's a strong statement. But it's right out of the Bible and I just read it. Now, let me preach just a little bit. Let me teach. And I pray God's peace and God's love and God's patience and his kindness and yet his power to speak to hearts today. You know, there's, there's different kinds of names. There's different kinds of adjectives to describe Christians. Now listen to this. I'm not trying to be silly. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying to be ugly. But just think about this. We have conservative Christians. We have liberal Christians. We have modern Christians. We have contemporary Christians. We have traditional Christians. We have uh, old-fashioned Christians. We have evangelical Christians and missionary Christians and Pentecostal Christians. And then if that isn't good enough, we just let's just stare it up a little bit. We've got old-fashioned evangelical missionary Pentecostal Holy Ghost-filled Christians. And I'm not being silly. We've got all these kinds of descriptions of Christians. Let me take it a step further. You better listen carefully because if you're just listening out of the corner of your ear, you're going to misinterpret what I say. We even have today gay Christians, homosexual Christians, adulterous Christians, alcoholic Christians. Then we have these Christians that are they call themselves, I'm a private Christian. It's very personal to me. We have Baptist Christians and Pentecostal preachers, Christians and Presbyterian Christians. and We got them all, haven't we? All kinds of descriptions. Now listen to this. Jesus Christ. You better get a pencil and write this down. Jesus Christ never gave anybody any instructions on how to be a Christian. Now listen again. Jesus Christ never gave any instructions in the Gospels on how to be a Christian. <clears throat> the truth is that in Jesus' time, they were never called Christians. They were called disciples. So where did the word Christian come from? Well, there's three places, and you can look it up in your concordance. There's three places in the New Testament where the word or the term Christian is used. The first place it is used in Acts 11, verse 26, where it says... <clears throat> they were first called Christians in Antioch. And then in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, King Agrippa, looking at Paul, said, Paul, are you trying to make me a Christian? And then the third place that we find it is over in First uh, Peter in chapter 4. Where Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 4, no, 1 Peter chapter 4, yeah. It says that yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him be ashamed. Not let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Listen to that. Now, that, now that's getting close. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. The next verse says, 
For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. I, I don't want to take it out of context. And I know there's been many a sermons preached from this. But when you put those two verses together, here's what it says to me. If you're going to use the name Christian, you better use the name Christian in such a way, and you better be a kind of Christian in such a way that you will bring, which you will bring honor and glory to the name and the person of Jesus Christ. Because judgment is going to begin in the house of God. I don't know about you. I don't know whether I can preach or teach very well, but I'm telling you right now, when I read God's word like that, I think to myself, dear God, don't let me disappoint you. Don't let me be deceived by Satan. Let me study your word and let me live out my life in the name and for the name of Jesus so, if you don't mind for just a few minutes, let's go back to Jesus. I made the statement that Jesus never gave any instructions on how to be a Christian. Let's go back and see what Jesus does give instructions, though. Listen to this. I'm going to read it again. It's in Luke chapter 14. The cost of discipleship, my Bible calls it. Great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them if anyone comes to me now he's going to explain now what it means to be a disciple he's going to put it in his own words <laughs> i'm not putting words in jesus mouth i'm not making something up here listen to what the listen to what the lord said listen to what the man said if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. What does he mean? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, what? Whew. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and not, is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him. You know, one of the reasons so many people say they don't want to be like that fellow or I don't need to be like them or if that's what a Christian is, I don't have anything to do with it, is because they have met so many people who started out and they profess Christ. Now, I'm not talking about backsliders here. I'm talking about people that, that made a profession they went through the motions. They, they jumped through the hoops. But then they turned away from the Lord. That doesn't mean they went out and started drinking liquor and chasing women. It just simply means that there was never any change in their heart. They never became a new creation. And yet they're still telling everybody, I got baptized when I was such and such, and I'm a Christian. And people say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't have anything to do with it. So they're mocked. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish it. All who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And then in verse 33, he says, Therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. And you know, Jesus, I'm getting ready to quote something Jesus said, and he says it often. When he gets through teaching a profound doctrine, He always closes it out with these words. Are you listening? He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord 
is saying. Let me tell you something. This is a fact. <clears throat> the word Christian, that's the word we're all familiar with. The word or the term Christian is used three times in the New Testament. I made reference to it a while ago. The word disciple, got your pencil ready? The word disciple is used, give or take a few, 300 times in the New Testament. Christian, three times. Disciple, <clears throat> just under maybe 300. Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, are you a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ? Answer that question. Are you one of these people who say, I love him, but I don't worship him? He's my Savior, but he's not my Lord? You don't say that, do you? That, that is not in the Scripture. It's nowhere in the Scripture. You can't find that. You can't even find in the Scripture where it says, I accept Jesus, or they accepted Jesus. It talks about receiving Christ, turning from your wicked ways, being born again, becoming a brand new creation, surrendering all things to him. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's describing what you have to do to be his follower, his disciple. I'd whole lot rather be a disciple and a follower of Jesus than to be called a Christian. <laughs> well, what did he mean? There's three times that he said, unless, unless you do this, you cannot be my disciple. He said to those people, if you don't hate your, if you, if you love your mother and your father and your brothers and your sisters and your wife and your children, if you love them more than you love me, you can't be my disciple. You know, Jesus said in, this, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you can't serve two masters. Now, this is strong teaching, people. I know that. It burns into my soul, I'll tell you. But what Jesus is really saying here is, you don't, you don't have to hate your mom and daddy. That, that's that's, that's anti-God. That's foolishness. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is, Compare your love to your mother and father and your brothers and sisters and your children and your wife. That love compared to the love of the love for me. Your love for me makes that look like hatred. That's all he's saying. Let me say it another way. You're to love Jesus. This is what Jesus said. If you're going to be my disciple, You've got to love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And here's why. It's because you're going to be required to do something. And if you don't love me with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength, you cannot be my disciple. And here's why. Because he goes on to say, if you're not willing to take up your cross... And follow me, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, if you don't love me with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength, when it comes time to die for me, you won't do it. You, you understand what he's saying? Where, where, where are you in all that? Where am I in all that? This is why, this is why we need to get down on our knees every night. And every morning, and get the Word of God out and read it so that He will empower us and strengthen us to be His disciples. So that if and when that time comes for us to, to die for Him, we can do it. And we can do it without any fear. We can actually do it with joy. But He said, He said it this way He said that you have to take up your cross daily. <clears throat> That doesn't mean taking up your cross, you're going to die. It just means that every single day 
you're willing to die for Jesus. And you just very well may feel like you're dying for Jesus, but you just keep right on going because people will persecute you. They will ridicule you. They will uh, deceive you. They will talk evil about you. All kinds of things that can happen to you. And you just, you just stand there and say, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And, and you will give your life to Jesus. And Jesus said, if you're not willing to do that, then you cannot be my disciple. Peter said, if you want to really live right, if you want to live the Christian life, you've got to be willing to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the word Christian is a wonderful description. It means someone who follows Christ. It's a wonderful word. They were first called Christians at Antioch. And King Griffith said, are you trying to make me a follower of Jesus? You're You're trying to get me to give my life and my heart to Jesus? Trying to make me a Christian? If you don't take up your cross, you're not willing to take up your cross, If you're not willing to love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you can't be my disciple. You can't be my follower. If you're not willing to take up your cross every day, you cannot be my follower, my disciple. And then he says in verse 33, he says, So therefore, anyone of you who does not renounce, boy, this is getting heavy here, renounce all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to renounce all that you have? What did did Jesus say? What did he say to the the rich young ruler? He said, the rich young ruler said, uh, how how can I get saved? What must I do to be saved? I'd like to be saved. I want to have eternal life. I, I want to be right with God. I'm a very religious man. I've, I've obeyed all the laws. I do the right thing. I'm a good person. I give to the poor. On and on and on and on. He went through all this and Jesus just let him go. Jesus led him all through all the laws. He said, I do all those things. I've been doing them ever since I was a child. I was raised in a home to do, to do good things, to do right. What, what do I need? What else you want out of me? What do I need to do? And Jesus looked at that fellow, but he looked at him with love. And I'm suggesting to you right now, even as I speak, God forbid that I'd have too much to say. I trust right now that God, by his love, he's looking at you with love. And he's saying, go sell all you have. Take you up your cross and follow me. (laughs) Renounce everything. Put me first. Now, folks, you, 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 you're just going to have to make your own application about that. I'm not trying to sell you on anything. I'm just simply telling you what Jesus said. And with the best of my ability, I'm trying to tell you what it means. You must love him with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. You must love him above everything and everybody. By the way, if, you've got, if you want to have a wonderful Christian home if you love Jesus more than you love your spouse and you love Jesus more than you love things and if you will follow him every day I can guarantee you that not only will you have eternal life not only will you be a quote Christian unquote But you will be so happy. And I promise you that. John the Baptist, he said it in a, such a sweet, sweet way. And the, his, what he said comes to my mind. John the Baptist said to his disciples, referring to Jesus, he said, he must increase. I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. That's how I feel about my Lord and my God, Jesus. I want him to increase in my life, and I want me to decrease. 
That's why I write people letters and I, they, they write me and they say, you know, nice things. And I say, it's the Lord's doing. It's the Lord's doing. There are many Christians. I'm sorry. There's many churches and homes today that are filled with. And I don't I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this to be ugly. I'm saying it in kindness. Sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes the truth can be misunderstood. But there are many churches and homes. People that are watching me right now are in their home. Some of them consider this church. And I'm honored that you would listen to me. But there are many churches and many homes that are filled with, quote, Christians, unquote, but very few disciples. Here's the word of God. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and easy is the way that leads to destruction or leads to hell. And that's the way most people are going. Those are the, that's what Jesus said. Enter by the narrow gate because The gate is wide. The way is easy. It's broad. And that's the way most people go, but it leads to hell. But the narrow gate, that is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's about as narrow as you can get. The narrow gate, it's narrow. It's hard. And the way is hard. It's not easy. But it leads to everlasting life. Why isn't it easy? Because you got to, and it's not hard to do once you come to know him. And once he gets a hold of your life, you will love him more than anyone else. You will uh, take up your cross daily and follow him. And you'll renounce everything. Nothing will be above or more important to you than Christ. But that will lead to eternal life. And there's very few that find it. My soul. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. He didn't say go and make Christians. Nothing wrong with that. But Jesus said go and make disciples. Teaching them what I have said and taught you. I pray for you and I trust that God has has spoken to your heart today. I'll see you next week. The Lord bless you. We thank you for being with us today. We trust this message has been a blessing and a challenge in your life. If we can minister to you in prayer, or if you would like to partner financially with Faith at Work to help us spread the gospel message, please contact us at the address on your screen. And we invite you to join us again next week at this same time. Until then, may God bless you and may Christ Jesus be your Lord.